Hey everyone, it's time for another episode of Mayhem in the Markets, coming to you Sunday, June 4th, and brought to you by Macrovisor, where we make macro actionable. We've seen the largest weekly inflow to tech ever, including during the dot-com bubble. I know it's not on the chart here, but that is what the Bank of America Research Report says, and I'm inclined to believe them because they have all of that data. What does this tell us? That maybe things are getting just a little bit lopsided on the bullishness in technology. A lot of it has started with this sort of AI bubble, and now it's starting to broaden out. Now, on the good uh, side of things, we are seeing breadth improve, which is very constructive, and we've seen that particularly on Thursday and Friday. But on the other side of it, we're seeing extremes that do cause a little bit of concern. And the real question is, how much money is left to come in, particularly into these lopsided long areas of the market when we're seeing this kind of activity. So on the good side, we're seeing breadth improve. We have skew on the rise. That indicates the market's relatively well hedged. We are getting into a time of the month when we have those delta and theta decay flows from Vanna and Charm that help to bid up or at least buffer downside in the markets. So there are some things that are positive, but on the other side of it, you've got a lot of money coming in uh, that has already allocated long. So the question is, who's left, right? So let's look at the next chart here. This is the CBOE index put call ratio. It hit a low we have not seen since early March of 2020. Now, some people have said, yes, but didn't the market go up a lot from there? Eventually. But first it went down about 800, 900 points. So I'm not saying that's what has to happen next, and certainly extremes can get more extreme, right? We could still see more bullishness in this ratio. We could see more call buying. We could see more high-flying techs running higher. But what concerns me a little bit is that this does show a degree of complacency, and you typically don't see this at the index level. As you can see in the chart here, it's kind of rare it gets to these sorts of extremes. This is the first time in over two years it's gotten quite this far. The last time it was this close to it was just before we had the Silicon Valley Bank implosion when it hit 0.8 in March. So again, just all things for us to keep an eye on. As we check our biases, we got to look at the data, and the data says people are getting really aggressively long. We also see that the overweight in bonds continues to increase towards great financial crisis levels. Now, why is this not the same now as it was then? It's a question I'm sure many would ask, and it's a great question. To me, it's not the same because back then the Fed had already cut to zero. They had already engaged in QE. Bond yields were already very low. And so when people were getting mega long bonds, they were doing it because they felt like the global financial system was coming off. The It was just becoming unglued. Like they felt like the entire global financial system was going to implode. And if you weren't around then in that environment, it was jarring. Day after day, you had bank failures, emergency interventions. There were days where stocks or even entire index futures were relatively bidless pre-market. It was a jarring time. And so you could understand why fund managers would go long bonds because they know, hey, at least here, it's likely I'll get all my money back. It's backed by the full faith of, and credit of the U.S. government if I own the paper and I hold it to maturity. This time is different, though, because, A, there's not that level of fear or angst in the system. And certainly, if you're really worried about the debt ceiling, you're not going to go super long bonds, right? Uh, so this is a little different. I think what's happening is, and yes, thankfully, the debt ceiling was a nothing burger. And we got through it just as I said we would, that it was not going to be a default. It's really about what happens after. We'll talk about that a little more. But first, it's tempting to buy duration here. Yields are attractive across a variety of different treasuries. So why wouldn't people want to get more exposure? And I can completely understand why managed money is getting into bonds here, but it's not because they're scared. It's not because they're bearish. It's not because they think that the, the financial system is about to come unglued. It's because there's actually really attractive opportunities in fixed income. I think that's one thing that's actually happening here um, with a little bit more 
of uh, certainty than just a panic into safety or whatever, especially with the market rising and the banking crisis seemingly behind us, at least under control. We'll probably see more issues with regionals turn up later this year in the realm of office building debt and commercial real estate in general, but also some of the other loans that they've been getting involved with over the last basically period of time you could see on this chart going back to 09 this period of financial repression but the other thing is last year there was a lot of outflows from bonds it was one of the worst years for the bond market we've ever seen so it's natural to see these kinds of inflows and we didn't see that in 08 going into 09 there wasn't like a catastrophe in the bond market we did we did have some inflation we did have yields go up but it wasn't anything like what we saw last year so those are some explanations as to why this isn't like a contrarian indicator it's more of an indicator of a rotation because the other thing is more and more wealth is kind of aggregated in older hands 50 and up and that means that people are looking for fixed income wherever they can get it as they get older they are advised by financial advisors to take on less risk because if you're 60 and you lose a lot of money in stocks it's a lot harder to get that back than if you're 40 right? So they change risk parameters. And it makes sense, but that's part of what I think we're seeing here is that rotation, the opportunity, fixed income being attractive, the alternative to equities being real. And we can see that global liquidity has been ample. I apologize, this chart's a little bit fuzzy, but basically the point here is that we've seen a large increase in global liquidity in March and April of this year. It has to do with some response measures from the Fed. It has to do with the Bank of Japan and People's Bank of China continuing to stimulate. This is temporary. This is not an impulse that uh, we could potentially rely on for much longer. And Bank of America is already saying that it's set to collapse by a trillion dollars in the next one to, th the next, I'm sorry, three to four months that world liquidity is set to collapse by that much. There's been other estimates as high as 1.6 trillion. But I think what the most important takeaway here is now that we're through the debt ceiling kabuki theater that was, as we've always been saying at Macrovisor, a nothing burger. It is time to issue a whole bunch of debt. And it could even be a debt tranche as large as 1.6 trillion, but at the very least 1.2 trillion by the end of the fiscal year of this government, which would be September 30th, is likely. And that will likely sponge up excess liquidity out of a variety of different areas. Bank reserves, reverse repos. We could see it from investment accounts because there could be some pretty attractive yields on those bills. I think if the bills are yielding over 6% uh, or over, it will attract some liquidity out of a variety of different areas. But net net, the impact is sponging up liquidity. And some of that, depending on where it comes from, particularly bank reserves, could have a negative impact on risk assets. Also, the push up of yields on the front end of the curve that this could cause is supply, 700 billion in bills to come out within probably the issuances of all of these will happen within four or five weeks of tomorrow, Monday. Right. So we're in that period where the, the liquidity is likely to at least be diminished. Now, does that immediately mean stocks have to go down and rates have to go up? No, it doesn't immediately mean that. But what it means is that the risk of those events happening, that liquidity is being pulled out of the debt markets and potentially the equity markets and currency markets and commodity markets to some degree, that's on the rise. That risk is real. We're also in the summer doldrums. That's a time where liquidity is quite low because there's less trading activity. So I think it amplifies volatility. It doesn't give us a clear sense of direction, but it does at least point to, with other periods of time like this, that the path of least resistance for some of these assets could be lower if indeed that treasury issuance begins to pull liquidity out of the financial system and reduce demand for some of these different assets. So what does that mean for us as traders and investors? It means that we're probably entering a different realized volatility regime. Implied volatility is a completely different beast. When we're looking at the VIX, we're looking at 30-day out implied vol, which doesn't mean much in a market where almost 50% of the opinion is being expressed in six and a half hour or less expirations in the options market with a lot of at the money or near to the money or in the money positioning. So there's not a lot of variance in price that would express uncertainty that would get vol really ramping 
And we do see skew is on the rise. We do see that fixed strike ball is on the rise. We do see certain areas that warrant attention. There's nervousness. There's greater hedging that is happening. But we don't see it in the VIX because the VIX has become a bit useless due to the amount of zero DTE trading and also vol selling, which has worked. I mean, look at the, the spot VIX trading around 14, 15 on Friday. So we are in a period of rather high levels of complacency with these inflows into tech and other parts of the market. This huge amount of call buying we've seen at the index level. I don't believe it's call selling. We saw some of that late Friday, but a lot of it was call buying. And then liquidity starting to come out of the market. Credit conditions continuing to tighten. The Fed likely to hike again in July. It just means be aware. I know a lot of folks out there, especially on social media, like to interpret everything as binary, either bullish or bearish. And it implies that there's an immediate position that if the thesis isn't right in the next five minutes, whoever stated it is wrong and should be made fun of aggressively. I would just take a step back and say that a lot of the working parts that happen in macro can take months to play out. And the sorts of things that I'm identifying and that we've been identifying at Macrovisor are themes that can take quite a while, but when they do start to matter to the market, it can happen slowly and then all of a sudden, sort of like bankruptcy, right? So it just means be aware, manage risk. There's no need to be a hero when the market has run as much as it has on the long or short side. For longs, it's probably a good time to start raising some cash and adding hedges where appropriate. For shorts, it's a time to continue waiting for an opportunity for momentum to change if you're shorting equities. There's plenty of short opportunities elsewhere, by the way. Shorting the yen has made a lot of sense against the U.S. dollar. Shorting the euro still seems to make sense against the dollar. There's always uh, opportunity somewhere. It doesn't always have to be in equities. There's also plenty of pair trades that continue to work. Short China long Japan has been a pretty decent one as well. So just broaden one's horizons. Keep our minds open. Always remember that there are factors at work in the background that can at least create the need to think through what this could mean for our positions over longer time horizons. Tighter lending standards, this is something I just talked about, point to a credit contraction and a recession. And this is a very likely scenario. And I know that people have said, oh, but it hasn't happened yet. And so that means it's not going to happen. I think it's more of a theme that it's been delayed but not canceled. I think we'll start to see more pressures in the back half of this year that we're, we're starting to approach. And we're likely to see that in credit markets because all of this credit contraction isn't just going to make it hard to take out new debt. It's going to make it hard to refinance existing debt. And there's a lot to be refinanced in the office building space. So I think that it's important to look at this data with a sense of the standards have tightened, but we haven't seen credit conditions, bank lending tighten commensurate yet. And it often does. The other thing I would say that's important is that it's a combination between what the Fed is doing, what banks are doing, what's happening in consumer behavior where they're saving more and trying to spend less on discretionary, where credit card debt is over a trillion dollars, the highest level it's ever been. And we start to see some of that weakness becoming more prevalent. Unemployment did rise to 3.7% on Friday, and that's because we did actually lose more jobs than we gained. If you look at the establishment versus household survey, it's pretty clear that there's a bit of a divergence going on. And I do think that the labor market, while strong by many accounts, if we factor for how low labor force participation remains, it's not as strong as it appears. And consumers don't necessarily have the elasticity in their budget and in their credit to continue consuming such that the economy grows. So non-defense spending has been a really important part of GDP. And that is not something you hang your hat on. A government-driven recovery at the end of a cycle is it's just... It's economically improbable, but it's also something you wouldn't want, just like a bull market starting from the highest valuations ever.
for the United States. It's not something you want as an investor because it makes it more likely the market is not going to last very long as a bull and that you won't get many uh, gains from here. So just things to consider. Lending standards tightening, the Fed tightening, liquidity tightening all around the same time amplifies risk. And risk is something we should be carefully managing in this environment. QQQ versus TLT. This is one of the charts that I share on Twitter regularly. It's pretty popular. And it's because it's been pretty accurate. When these divergences get quite wide, we often see one catch to the other. And particularly when TLT is above QQQ, QQQ tends to catch up. And when QQQ is above TLT... They see more, it's, it's been more likely that QQQ catches down. Now, is the correlation broken? That is the question. And I don't know yet. We'll have to see how this plays out. I think it's unlikely. I think that this chart serves, serves as a, a very quick and easy way of looking at risk premiums. And they suggest that really equity uh, buyers right now are taking a lot of risk. And uh, I think that that could cause some issues when the probability of rates going higher is rising. That that's likely to start to create some pressure on these rate sensitive stocks, which tech, growth, biotech, all that fall with it. So I would just be a little bit cautious. You got record tech inflows, enormous amounts of index uh, call buying, equity call buying, ETF call buying. And then you've got growing divergences all as we have tightening credit and liquidity going into the back half of this year when a lot of these pressures are likely to worsen. So am I saying the top is in? No, but I'm saying I think there's more risk to the downside than upside. And I think that these macro risks, while well, it's been fine to ignore macro for some time, are beginning to permeate. We can see the year to date heat map tells the story of narrow breadth. There are a lot of very impressive gains in tech. NVIDIA up 169%, Meta up 126%. I mean, that's phenomenal. And whomever was out there that captured a good chunk of those gains, kudos to you, or capturing any of these others. Because this has been a great trader's market in tech. It's not quite as investable, because I'm not so certain that these gains are going to hold, but it's at least been a great trade. And uh, even Tesla up 73.7%. I mean, that's a phenomenal gain. Even Amazon, 47.92%. AMD up 81%. I mean, this, is, this is serious stuff. Salesforce, 60%. But look at the rest of the heat map. We're almost halfway through the year, 5 twelfths. And this is a heat map that shows a lack of conviction in much of the rest of the market. That's what concerns me a little bit. You can see cyclicals getting sold. You can see defensives getting sold. But you see a huge bid concentrated in tech. And sure, there's green elsewhere. But it's really about 97% of the gains year to date are from about 15 stocks. The biggest. And so I, I think that still warrants concern. We are seeing breadth improve, which is great. It needs to keep improving. Because some of these losses we've seen here are... Uh, concerning. And there's reasons behind some of them, like Schwab down 37 point, or 34.7%. We, we, we know that there's some issues over there. Bank of America down 13%. This is the money center bank with the largest unrealized losses. So we know there's some issues over there. But just, it's worth keeping an eye on. And energy stocks cooling off after having such a hot year last year with oil not really catching up to their gains. That makes sense too. Although many of them are still in very good positions overall. So I would just say this is something to keep an eye on. This heat map from Finviz, you can check out on their website. You can do, you know, one week. You can do one month. You can do year to date. You can do one year. I think these are things to keep track of as we go throughout the year. The next one is the number of S&P stocks beating the index. I'm sure this is a little bit different after last week. But basically, the last reading we have on this chart was as low as we've seen back in 2000, 2001. So that was very disconcerting to see that level of very low participation to the upside beating the index. Now, obviously, we're starting to see some uh, greater levels of new highs and we're starting to see some more stocks beat the index. So let's see if that can continue. 
Let's see if we actually see some momentum carry us through 4,300 on SPX. But for now, and that's where a very large wall of calls is, so it could act as resistance. But for now, it's all worth watching, all this data, to see whether or not this breadth improvement can continue, that we can see it expand out to more and more sectors. Value is trailing growth, and this is something that has been a bit of a throwback. We're going all the way back to, I think, 2001 here to see this level of narrowness. So it's about two decades ago that we have seen this amount of outperformance by growth over value. I and mean, growth just absolutely killed value last month. The pair trade of last month was long growth, short value, and you were killing it. But it also suggests that, again, there's a lot of in unusual stuff happening. Unless this is a new early cycle environment, which everything that we understand about economics and credit cycles would strongly argue against, it doesn't make sense that this early cycle stuff is running so hot. Here's another example. NASDAQ 100 versus Russell 2000. At an extreme we haven't seen this time since about 2000. So, again, you know, this is something that is... A bit of a warning sign. I don't think it means an imminent crash or anything like that. And I know, again, there's this sort of idea that you show a chart that has any kind of extreme and then immediately you're some kind of perma bull or perma bear. And if you're not right within five minutes, you're a charlatan. But what I would suggest is looking at this chart with just a little bit of nuance and say, wow, that is quite an extreme between the heavyweight techs and the small caps. And remember in the Russell 2000, about 42% of the companies in there don't make any money. There are a lot of regional banks. There are reasons for the Russell to underperform, but it's still noteworthy. Number of S&P 500 companies that are citing AI on earnings calls is the highest it's ever been, with 110 of them during quarter one earnings season. Now, I think this will trend will probably continue, but I still believe that to, for a lot of the AI stuff that's out there, the hype outweighs the substance, and that's a concern. And that's not to say there's not a promise. I've said all along, AI is going to be very important. I just think that the excitement about it is getting a little ahead of what it's able to do in the here and now. And companies are hanging their hat on this, and it's allowing them to deliver gains for investors. But the question is, are we going to see companies then citing AI and attributing it to margin expansion? Are they going to attribute it to better bottom line earnings saying, oh, wow, the productivity boost we've gotten from language learning models and, you know, machine learning, um, automation, other kinds of things that are associated with AI, but may or may not be. Are we seeing that create a lot more profitability? If we can see that from an increasing number of S&P companies moving forward, and they can quantify it accordingly on their earnings calls. That will be much, much more encouraging to me. I want to see some proof. American companies have led the way in buying back record amounts of their own shares. This chart goes back about 10 years. And believe it or not, Apple was about $600 billion of this. They are one of the most aggressive buyers of their own shares. And, you know, that's, uh, it, it is a company that is uh, over, well over $2 trillion in market capitalization. But at the same time, buying back $600 billion of your own shares, particularly over the last 10 years where you had nowhere near that market cap, it does distort multiples, right? It makes earnings per share seem more attractive. It compresses PE. What you're doing when you're buying back your own shares is you're taking them out of the float. So it changes the metrics. So it's just something to think about. It's not a criticism of Apple as a company, but I wonder if some of that cash could have been put to better use elsewhere with acquisition or innovation or otherwise. And speaking of Apple, their revenue is the highest of these tech companies, almost all of them put together, right? So Apple has the highest revenue per employee, 2.4 million per employee, whereas these other techs have an average revenue per employee of 831,000. So that's a pretty significant difference. That's like threefold more efficient. So Apple's definitely doing a lot of things right. And in terms of their total revenue, it outpaces Meta, Sony, Lenovo, Oracle, Netflix, NVIDIA, and Adobe as of last year. This is probably going to look a little different this year. But it's still a very interesting comparison. And it shows you just how big the tech titan really is. 
Hang Seng China gauge briefly enters bear market territory. It's given up all its gains year to date. So have pretty much all the Chinese stocks. This is a pretty disconcerting sign. People like to say the market's forward looking. It's forward looking in this case into the Chinese reopening that wasn't right. It never really materialized. It's just sort of been, um, I would say, weak because their construction and real estate markets are not able to pick up the slack. There's a lot of problems there with the developers. We've seen that with Evergrande defaulting on a tranche of its debt recently. And construction and real estate are the most important parts of China's economy. So if it's not firing off, that's subduing a lot of demand for energy and raw materials. Now, China's a big buyer of oil. They continue to buy oil, but it's questionable as how much of that they're using. And then with copper, stockpiles are low, but usage is low too, because if you're not building cities, if you're not building, you know, lots of EVs, things like that, copper usage tends to diminish, right? It's, it's Dr. Copper and its economic diagnosis here is that the economy is weak. It's also fallen quite a bit. But what we're seeing in stocks over here in China, this was supposed to be another decoupling economy and it's not. And I think that that is likely to have a negative drag impact on other emerging markets. And it's one of the reasons that I started talking about the long Japan, short China trade, because Japan actually has some signs that its economy is, is really beginning to improve. And China's the opposite. So because Japan's still in QE eternity mode with their yield curve control program, I felt like that was a better place for capital. And then China is they're, they're stimulating, but the stimulus is readily being absorbed by all of the pressure in their economy. And they've got this huge hangover from having things locked down for the better part of three years that really um, has caused a lot of damage. I'm not sure all of it can be repaired anytime soon. Now, moving on to student debt, student debt is at $1.76 trillion in the U.S., and it's likely that repayments will have to be made pretty soon. I think this will matter. I, I think that it's not about repayments by themselves in isolation. It's about putting everything together and realizing that the cumulative impact here is significant. And this is something that Aisha and I talked about on the Macrovisor podcast. If you don't listen to the Macrovisor podcast, I highly recommend it. It's, it's great content. I mean, if I, do, if I don't say so myself, since I'm one of the hosts, but no, we really go into a lot of different subjects that are a lot of fun to listen to. And uh, we put it out every week. Sometimes it's a Twitter Spaces Sometimes it's just a podcast between the two of us. We're going to start getting some guests in as well, though. But I recommend it. You can check it out on any major podcast service, Apple, Amazon, Google, Spotify, whatever you prefer. So, uh, and would love to have you as a subscriber to that podcast. If you're already on my YouTube channel, subscribe. Thank you for that. And thank you for your support. But the cumulative effects here are, are worth considering because the cumulative effects are that people that don't have spare capital for this are going to see their monthly cost of living go up even further. And I think what it's likely to actually equate to is more trouble in debt markets. People are going to have to prioritize payments. There's likely to be more stress. I think it'll also lead to less consumption uh, because a consumer that's struggling with all these different debt payments, particularly a 20, 30 something contingent, that demographic has the highest delinquency rates on their credit cards since 2010. They also have the lowest home ownership that that age group has ever had going back to pre-World War II. And I think that's a, a bit of a concern. This is a group where about 40% live with their families, and there's nothing against that. There's nothing wrong with that. They have to because this is a unaffordable situation for many as first-time homebuyers. And unfortunately, this won't make that any easier. You've got a whole generation that have been priced out of the American dream. And if you've been listening to my channel for a while, you know that's a theme I've talked about. Well, this makes that worse. And I'm not saying that people shouldn't pay debt that's owed. But I'm saying that the timing of this and that everything else that's going on probably couldn't be worse for them. And that's going to have, in aggregate, drag impacts on the economy with everything else taken into consideration. And bankruptcies among large companies are on the rise this includes bankruptcy filings of companies with publicly traded shares or bonds and assets or liabilities of two million or greater and private companies with assets or liabilities of 10 million or greater. These bankruptcy filings from January through April are the largest we've seen since 2010. A lot of things that are happening the most since 2010. But uh, I think it just tells you about how we're seeing signs underneath the surface that things aren't 100% okay. I know markets by and large go from the bottom left of the chart to the upper right of the chart, you know, higher and higher over time. 
and that's still my base case that, you know, over a long enough time period, we'll still see higher highs in the market. The question is, from what price? And I still think that we have a re-rating of risk lower before this whole thing shakes out. And remember in 2000, after the dot-com uh, bubble was busting, there were five or six new bull markets, quote unquote, in the NASDAQ, where it rallied over 20%, sometimes over 30 or 40%, before subsequently falling to new lows. I'm not saying that's what's happening here, but it's worth considering that as a possibility. There can be a lot of head fakes. And year-over-year -year growth in investor purchases of real estate is at the lowest level that we have ever seen. This is because financial conditions are tightening, rates are high, you know, you have uh, less availability of capital to people that want to borrow from lenders, and you have prices that are, that are still high. And it's hard for an investor to make decent rent because a lot of the landlords got in at lower prices and they're offering what would be a competitive rent to a mortgage right now. So we can see that the spread between a mortgage and a rent is actually negative, meaning a lot of these investors would make no money on these properties if they were in it for uh, producing income as a landlord. The other thing about it is, think about it this way, why did a lot of people get into being landlords for yield, particularly institutions? Well, now you can just buy bonds or, or notes or bills. You don't need to buy real estate as an income producing asset anymore. And the confidence in Jerome Powell is actually the lowest of any Fed chair going back over two decades. Poor Jay seems to have rattled the nerves of a lot of people calling inflation transitory and having it not be anything like that. And uh, yeah, I, I think that he deserves a little bit of this skepticism, unfortunately, because he has wavered on his commitment to inflation a little bit. He, he seemed off his game at a couple of these meetings. And the idea of Jackson Hole, we're going to rain down fire and brimstone and bring pain and control inflation. Well, the market's higher than it was at Jackson Hole. It's actually up marginally, just a fraction of a percent, from when the Fed started tightening. So where is the monetary policy impact? Where is the tightening. You're, you're, we've been told over and over again not to fight the Fed, but everyone who has been fighting the Fed has been making money this year. So I think it's important that uh, Jerome Powell tries to reestablish his credibility. I think that he will in the sense that he'll ultimately prevail against the shorter term demand driven inflation component. But ironically, the policy that the Fed is engaging in is likely to make structural inflation worse because now it's making being a part of the supply chain more capital intensive because of the cost of capital. Then there's the lack of availability of capital, plus wages continue to rise. So you're likely to see more companies saying, we're not going to expand supply, we're going to shrink supply because we see business conditions worsening at the same time. So I think it's all worth taking into consideration that this is not a situation where we just crush demand and inflation goes away like it did you know, after the 1980s. We need another thing that we had in the 1980s, which was supply-side economics. We need to stoke the availability of supply in energy, in food, in metals, I mean, and in labor too. We need better immigration policy, quite frankly. And that's one of the only ways out of this. It's not just going to be the Fed. And that's not meant to be a political commentary. It's just objective analysis. I, I have no love for either party. I just think that we need to fix things. Uh, recession gauge here keeps rising. We've got 13 plus months of leading economic indicators negative uh, since 1960. Any time with six or more months of leading economic indicators in the negative has led to a recession. I don't think this time is going to be different. And uh, this gauge moves, as it says, abruptly higher into recessions. We're starting to see some of that. We're certainly above levels we were during the COVID crash. So I want to thank you for watching. Really appreciate your support. And your support is what makes all of this possible. So do consider checking out macrovisor.com, where my partner Aisha and I make macro actionable and easier to understand. That's all for the longer term investor and for the macro longer term swing trader. For the shorter term trader, who's more technical, we've got traderaid.com where you can learn more about technical short to intermediate term trading and you get 20% off on me by using the code mayhem20 at checkout. You also get a free 10 day trial on either a monthly or yearly base plan. You can follow me on Twitter at mayhem for markets and be sure to like, subscribe and share. And I hope you all have a great trading week ahead. 
and I will look forward to catching up with you soon.